Im Wettbewerb der Berlinale vertreten. Entering the Berlinale Competition is German Director Andreas Dresen, who has repeatedly been successful in Berlin, most recently two years ago with Rabia Kornas versus George W. Bush. The marvelous leading actress Meltem Kaptan was awarded a silver bear. This time he has another great leading actress, Liv Lisa Fries, who gained international recognition in Babylon, Berlin. She plays Hilde Koppi, a resistance fighter who was killed by the Nazis after giving birth to her child in prison, a very human drama about a courageous woman. So, kleine Runde. Ich 
ich dir doch nicht zeigen soll? Doch. Doch. Für Nachrichten. An die Freunde. Den sowjetischen Geheimdienst? Der Kontakt kam über Aro. Die wollen Informationen von ihm aus dem Luftfahrtministerium. Was für Informationen? Das war blöd von mir. Ich will dich da nicht reinziehen. Was für Informationen? Na, wo Hitler aufmarschiert? Mit welcher Truppenstärke? Wann er angreift? Und, und so weiter. Die Sowjetunion angreift? Das ist nur eine Frage der Zeit. Und wie kann ich dir helfen? Dankeschön. Sie können sich jetzt Thank you very much. You may now please take your seats. A cordial welcome to the 74th Berlinale and to the press conference for From Hilde with Love, the contribution to the competition. I am very pleased to be able to sit here with these great guests. Let me start on the far right from my position. Claudia Steffen, who is the producer. Laila Stieler, Laila Stieler, who is the screenwriter. Andreas Dresen, Andreas Dresen and Laila Stieler, of course, again, after last year's Rabbi Connors versus uh, George Bush. Uh, welcome to Andreas Dresen, the director. And a cordial welcome also to our wonderful actors, Liv, Lisa Fries, and Johannes Hegemann. And Johannes Hegemann. And the producer, Christoph, the producer, Christoph Friede, also many times a guest here at the competition. Let me get started with an introductory question and then we will give you the floor. Now the question to Andreas Dresen and to Laila Stieler. Now, you've worked together quite a few times, but it is by no means to be expected that you would again start working on the next script written by Laila. First of all, Laila, um, Andreas, what is it that you found so appealing about this script? Well, the human dimension and the humanity of it. You know, I read it and I really fell in love with the main character. She's such a, you know, silent and upright and, uh, you know, decent woman that I really felt like making the movie right away. Lila had written the script quite wonderfully because it's not this kind of heroic view on resistance as it was in the GDR, you know, where I grew up and I was uh, used to the stylized presentation of these kinds of resistant fighters. They were depicted almost as superheroes and you always felt tiny next to these giants, which is also why you would never never have dared to show any form of resistance because you kept telling yourself, I couldn't do anything like that. But now these people were at eye level, really, and you could wonderfully see that they were young, that they went for swimming, that they loved each other, that they had ice cream together and then acted so bravely in the world that they were living in. And I thought that was really great about the script. Und Laila, wie war das für dich? Warum and Laila, how was it for you? Why did you decide to focus on Hilde instead of on the Red Orchestra? Well, for the very same reason that Andy just gave us. 
On the one hand, I was fascinated by Hilde because she is uh, such a sensitive, perhaps a too sensitive woman, an almost, you know, fearful but very silent person who then was able to carry out these heroic deeds, we might call them today, but for her it was just a natural thing to do because she was doing it because of the decency that was living inside her, because it was absolutely clear to her that she wanted to be a decent person and remain one. And then, of course, there was a second reason that I found very important as a woman. And that's, you know, this element or the moment, you know, where she is incredibly strong when she's giving birth to her child, you know. I mean, how does it even work to have a child while you are imprisoned? And then these eight months that she is spending or that she was allowed to spend with her child in prison, this time made her so strong, or she was so strong during that time, that she could and wanted to give her child so much love that it might be enough for her whole life. Thank you. The first question over here. Thank you. I've got a question to Andreas and to Liv. First of all, congratulations on this movie. And now you're presenting it here against the backdrop of the rise of the AFD far-right party in Germany and ahead of three very important regional elections in the so-called new federal states and also against the backdrop of a debate here at the Berlinale that focused on whether it was right to disinvite the AFD politicians. Again, that was initially invited. Now, this movie against this societal backdrop, you know, did you want to embed it that way on, and what's your take on the debate? <laughs> well, the debate is, uh, you know, getting a bit tiresome, you know, it really is getting difficult. Because, you know, you say, people always say that the Berlinale is a political festival, but we have to really make sure that it will not turn into a festival of politics. And that we're still talking about movies and films, but to answer your question, you know, the people who had to take this decision and who were responsible and who had to take this decision on the occasion of the opening of the Berlinale, well, I really feel sorry for them. It must have been hell and quite a lot of pressure. I am really pleased always to see people from all the different political parties to see and watch our movie. And I think people from a particular party might learn especially important things. Well, that, I think, is the question that I've been looking forward to most of or all of these days. I believe that some... But first of all, thank you very much for being allowed to be here. You know, I am from Berlin. This is a Berlin festi festival, and I am incredibly proud to be part of this festival. And I would just love to be able to focus more on what we want to say and not quite as much on, you know, the things that life forces upon us. I think it is very important that we all try to deal with the things that we want and the things that we want to say yes to. And I can only say that all the people that are confronted with violence, you know, I want to tell them that I feel solidarity for them. I am against all forms of ostracism and discrimination. And I'm very aware that these are complicated times and that all of these debates are highly complex and that I don't have any interest whatsoever to make statements that are either right or wrong because it feels like it's almost no longer possible. I can very clearly speak up against the AFD, which I would like to do on this occasion, actually. But when we're talking about invitations in the area of culture, I think we really need a political discourse, and I am not a politician. I am an artist. And I've made this movie, you know, I decided to make this movie with one of the best filmmakers that we have, Andreas Dresen. And I'm incredibly proud to have made this movie with Andreas. I grew up with his films and I think he's a, just a great director. And what is super important to me is that I played a role, a character, a human being that actually existed, Hilde Koppi, who was, you know, a very 
silent kind of person. And what I think is important is that we also allow for a bit more of these silent tones to creep into the debate, that we also allow for the things to happen inside of us and that we don't always have to you know, present every single opinion that we have trying to bash each other. And I mean, but uh, I think, I presume that you have many more questions, right? Hello, this is Natalia Zhuk, Movie Crime Kiev, and um, Hello, Natalia Zhuk from Movie Crime Kiev in uh, Karta, Berlin. First of all, thank you very much. You know, I haven't cried that much in months, I think. And I also believe that this is one of the greatest performances I've seen this year so far. So, I hope the jury will see it that way too, Liv. And I've got two, two questions, Liv. The process of uh, preparing for the shooting, you know, this part that is um, taking place in the prison and that is directly before the execution, you know, for us viewers, it was really terribly difficult to witness it. But, uh, you know, I don't know how you, how you dealt with that, whether you went to psychotherapy or something, you know. Then the second question, and this goes to the whole team, there are these two very important characters, the pastor and Ms. Kuhn, who are part of the system but still remain human beings and try as far as possible to help the main characters and to somehow, you know, save their humanity. So, how were these people created, or are they based on real persons, or is this kind of, you know, um, an amalgam of existing persons? Wow, it is just so difficult to remember these things, um, you know, to me at least. No. You know, how did I prepare for the whole, you know, shooting that took place in the prison and in the cell? Well, we shot chronologically, and first we thought that was a good idea, but of course then in the end it turned out to be very, very difficult to spend so much time there in prison, you know, the scenes with the baby, you know, when talking about the project. And, you know, I'm also talking to myself about these things because I'm thinking about all the things that I do there, but at the same time, you know, I don't really have a master plan. It's the first time that I'm here. I'm sitting here for the first time. You're asking me this question for the first time. Of course, I am. Um, I have done this work, but you know, when doing this work, I'm talking about a kind of duality of closeness because it was always somehow about me, and it was also always about the, the the character I was playing. So and so, this also was true in prison. I were was always confronted with myself, you know, when I'm holding a tiny human being in my arms, then I'm there in a double function, you know, as the actor. I'm there as Liv taking care of the child and I'm there as Hilda taking care of that child. And that, and Laila mentioned that initially, that is also something that gave her so much strength and that also gave me so much strength because there is a living being there that needs me to exist and that needs me to be present with everything I have and that I am. And I think that gave me a lot of strength. And apart from that, I thought it was terrible. It was really horrible, you know, even until today. You know, I find this uh, to be an incredible story, an incredible story that happened there, you know, this moment when I uh, am holding, you know, the personally signed original, you know, original signed by Adolf Hitler, my appeal, um, you know, this was real, that was not fiction, you know, when I appealed for pardon. So we never made that up. Okay. Um, yeah, to to your questions to Harald. Well, to, to come back to your questions, Harald Bölsch, Annelise Kühn. Uh, uh, 
Wir beide sind in der genau. The two of us. We grew up in the GDR in former Eastern Germany. We learned a lot about antifascism in school. Mostly, those were heroes. They were put onto a pedestal, and you know they were impossible to reach. And here in this project, and also when we discovered Hilde, we right from the beginning wanted to talk about all the things in between. You know the and how we can get close to these characters and the people later on and in this context i also first discovered these two characters annalisa Pocha, uh, or, or rather pastor Pocha and um, ms annalisa kuhn they both existed harald Pölchau, the pastor who witnessed, had to witness so many executions. There is um, a slim book he wrote, and he actually was a priest or a pastor in the resistance. So he not only offered support to the prisoners that were executed, but he also helped hide Jews and help people to cross the border and flee the country. So he is a very liberal, a very active and a very modern person. So that was highly interesting. It really is worth reading his book. And this encounter with Hilde never really happened. So I just imagined how such a person might react when meeting my Hilde. And the Anneliese Kuhn is more of a compilation of different prison wardens, different prison guards. So Anneliese Kuhn actually existed, but she was more like a kind of a Madonna for the imprisoned women. She was um, a helpful angel. And then there was another prison guard who was very strict but also fair. And these two real persons I tried to combine in one character. And in Pölchow and in Kuhn, what I again was interested in was, you know, the things in between. You know, they were part of the system and yet they were not trying to be heroes. These nuances were interesting, that they were doing these very courageous things. Peter Paul Huth from Interfilm Frankfurt. I have a question. Andreas Dresen and Leila Stieler. You know, I quite frequently um, feel a bit uncomfortable about the films, German films that deal with this time. And also when it comes to foreign films that look at this time that were very much hyped, but it was entirely different in this case. And I asked myself, why? And so how do you manage to avoid the trap falls and the pitfalls of cliches and at the same time to give the necessary space to the characters, albeit they might be scripted, you know, also the space and the time, you know, they don't have, get the commando and have to start right away saying all the important phrases. They're allowed to think about things in between. That was an enormous achievement. So I wanted to ask you how you managed to do that. How man did you manage to avoid cliches and how did you create the space for putting this all into scenes. Well, avoiding cliches for us was actually very important because, uh, you know, the examples that you just mentioned, you know, those are the ones that I also had to think about, you know, these sepia-colored depictions of uh, violent Nazi hordes that don't really leave you space even for your own thoughts and where you can actually, you know, rather well hide behind, you know, because you can tell yourself, well, these are so evil and they are so brutal, I don't have anything to do with that, thankfully. But Lionel already touched upon this topic because it was important for us as well that the people who are working on behalf of the system in that movie, that a large part of them are rather friendly. You know, the judge is not Freisler who is shouting and barking in court. He is, you know, appears to be a rather um, decent person and yet he is pronouncing a death sentence as such a system is being carried by millions of people who are opportunists and to just adapt themselves. You don't have to be loud for that. It can be very, very soft and almost silent. That is just as dangerous. And to us it was important to show that both the people in the resistance and the people that are working for the system that you can you know, find your own reflection in these people and so that you would ask yourself, where would I have been? 
And that is also why we try to tell this movie, you know, um, closer to today. You know, it's not a dehistoricized movie. You've got the old cars and everything, but we also did not want to overemphasize the historic elements. You don't see any parades. You don't see a single, uh, you know, swastika on a flag. You don't hear the sound of marching boots. Nothing of that. And when looking at the costumes of the younger people, we have a nice mix. You know, the our um, you know, costume were, you know, rather modern and our designer, you know, we mixed all, everything from different decades and we just wanted to show that these were young people who could be living today because today it's just as important to have a clear position on certain questions and that is why we made that step, you know, and, and decided not to look into the past like we were visiting a museum but that we tried to, you know, have many different topics side by side with all the possible implications and contradictions. Well, when writing, you know, I wanted to make sure that these people, and especially Hilde, can appear as young and as modern as possible, because the distance that you quite frequently recognize when looking at historical movies, you know, that is actually something that doesn't exist. Those were young people as well. They fell in love. They had their passions, so what kind of difference does it make compared to today? And I tried to even get this and carry this into the language that people were using. And, you know, don't forget that these young women came from the Weimar Republic, from the 20s, the Roaring Twenties. They had a rather emancipated understanding of themselves, and then they, um, you know, were living in Nazi times with people who wanted to banish them to the home and the half. So they were, you know, rather vexed and uh, angry about what to expect from that society. And this kind of modernity I try to describe also in these, you know, dialogues that they had that are probably close to what they actually sounded like. And, you know, the silence that you realized here, that you experienced here, is something that is emanating from uh, Hilde. I also wanted to use this as a new element. It's not just new for live. And I also was planning to write a movie that was tender. That was very much in the head, heading of the whole oh, project. No, after, after you, uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, you can talk. I think you can yes, talk. Yes, yeah, yeah, Pl oh, bitte, okay. yeah, intruding. <laughs> the. My name is Mahari Sigit, <laughs> African Refugee News. Uh, Mr. Dresner, this is the most beautiful breakfast that I had in 20 years. <laughs> oh, really? A fantastic film, also to the script writer. Uh, can you tell me more about the ensemble, all the girls who were working, because they were perfect? Well, thank you very much. Would you like to say a few words about the ensemble of women? that played. Well, let me perhaps get started. In the original, the first idea, it was supposed to become a TV series that Lila had started working on about women in the resistance, which I think is a fantastic idea. Because if you look at the Red Orchestra in particular, uh, you will realize how many young and strong women were working there. And they were not just there for making coffee. They were very much active participants. And it's great to see that. And, you know, by the way, in this group of people, what I personally found very interesting was that you've got something of a diagonal line going all through the whole of society. You've got scholars, scientists, you've got artists, you've got with Harald Schulze Boysen, you've got an officer from the army. You've got people from the working class, like Hilden Hans, you know, Hans was a craftsman. You've got students, and looking back, it's just nice to see that there was this overarching resistance, even during those very, very tough times, and I find that uh, is a bit of a consolation, really, and especially that so many women played such an important role. Well, because 
because of uh, a discussion I had with a producer, you know, I was just pointed to the history of German resistance and uh, she asked me whether I wanted to look into it. And I said, okay, I'll accept that this might fit in well with my approach. And then I rediscovered uh, the Red Orchestra for myself because, you know, as I said, uh, during my school days, I had heard so much about them already. But back then, they were heroes, you know, spies for the Soviet Union who had done so much and achieved great things. But when looking into their stories again as a grown-up, as an adult person, I got to see something entirely different. I got to see that they were young people and these many, many great women, you know, and especially Hilda that I found so fascinating and uh, that I felt so attracted to. And there was another aspect, you know, and that's the fact that after 1990, the Soviet Union, or Russia today, um, have opened their archives and that there were new insights on the whole spectrum of resistance organization, the Red Orchestra. And uh, there you could then suddenly read that all of these radio messages that were sent out, uh, you know, in, in mortal danger, which just got stuck somewhere in the atmosphere and that only one of these radio messages got through and that gave me an entirely different idea and that was the question of whether it was actually worth it. Was it really worth it that they all gave their lives for something that, you know, never really reached its goal? And we try to answer that question by saying, yes, yes, you know, decency is always worth it. And I think it's not just decency, you know, human decency, it's also the kind of, uh, you know, connectedness, being connected to others is always worth it. That, I think, is one of the most important things in life, you know. I'm sitting here right now and I'm totally excited, but then I look at Andy or Johannes and I look at the people in the audience that I know. Yes, yes, we're just holding on to each other. So it really is worth it. Okay, another question. Marine Baranowska from Deutsche Welle. First of all, I would like to thank you most cordially for this movie. I cried rivers of tears like I haven't done in a very long time. And this film, this movie really shows also these young people that are protesting almost in silence. And I could see so many parallels to today's situation in Russia. And that also gives me the hope that there might be people in Russia who are also not, you know, following this heroic idea, but are protesting, even if only in silence. And I wanted to ask you a question to Lila and to Andreas. When you wrote the screenplay, did you think about any parallels in today's Russia? And then there is another point I'd like to make with the next question. You know, when these young people are sitting there, you know, having coffee and cake, and then, you know, the, you've got the waiter who says, Stalingrad, it will be ours, you know. And that is a parallel, you know, I think, to Russia today where people say Crimea is ours, you know, after the annexation of Crimea. Is that a coincidence or were you actively thinking about this parallel? Well, you know, it takes quite a while to work on a screenplay. And uh, this project, I started working on it in 2015. And, uh, you know, the screenplay on this movie, I started in 2018. So it was still a coincidence. If that is a parallel that you recognize, well, then of course it is not a coincidence either. We are open to these kinds of interpretations. Uh, that's also what movies are there for. You know, that we wanted to tell a story about a movement, tell a story that can be interpreted. But in concrete terms, you know, that was not my original intention. 
Revolution, I, you know, try to just work on the basis of a certain timeline, you know, and you can, of course, also look at certain things and, and put them, layer them on top of the film, you know, if you will, but we're moving through the years 41, 42, 43 with this movie. Well, I would like to add something to this, and that's, uh, you know, this is actually something that I love about movies, that in different people there is a different resonance, they react to it differently, that in different countries people watch this movie in different situations, living different lives, and that they might read something entirely different into a movie, and that might even be different from what we originally were thinking about, and it's not a bad thing, not at all. That's a kind of space that we want to offer to people so that they can think about things themselves and develop their own emotions because, you know, emotions are just as important in this movie because the characters that are central are just so rich and that is why I'm so pleased that you would spot these parallels because there are these parallels. Other people might see others or other things, recognize other things in the movie. You know, but the problems, the situations that we describe using Hill's example, you know, that's terribly enough an example that is not a part of the past. Political terror still is part of our present and it is not quite so far away as we would wish it to be. I would very much wish this movie not to be quite as current as it is. Just a brief uh, remark in the middle, we also have uh, Johannes Hegelmann here who is very experienced in the theater and the Thalia Theater in Hamburg, Berlin Ensemble. He also played in other movies and TV series, but for me, he's a fresh face here on stage, a great performance, and the chemistry with Liv was also great. Johannes, how was it for you to have a part in this movie and to discover the role of Hans Koppi? Well, to me, it was incredibly exciting. You know, it was the first time, you know, I had already shot a few minor roles, but to really get started like that and to play alongside Liv, you know, and in the beginning, I was super excited. I thought, oh my God, what am I doing here? But you calm down rather quickly. Oh, it's just her. No, but, uh, you know, they're all such professionals and they're also so cordial well at least you know the outward appearance is very professional but they really invited me in and they were so cordial we had such a great mood among ourselves and it was all the time it was at eye level so i really had a great time also you know in terms of the personal aspects and playing this role was quite a thing for me, you know. I thought about uh, Hans Koppi so much, you know. Hans Koppi died when he was 26. I was 25 when we started shooting and, you know, thinking about um, showing this kind of courage at that age. I'm pretty sure that Hans Koppi knew what was at stake, the risks that he was accepting and the, what it means to pull these activities through. And, of course, you are always reflecting these things and uh, compare yourself. And I still think that it was, he must have been an impressive character to be so courageous at that age and such a brutal regime to carry out these activities. So we will allow for another 10 minutes. We have a little more time, but I would like to ask you to please uh, keep your questions brief and only ask one question so as to make sure that as many journalists can take the floor as possible. Okay, the next, please. Johannes Littfeld from Radio X in Frankfurt on Main. A question to Andreas Dresen. I'll try to be brief. You know, I still feel very much affected by this film. It was an intense experience, which is very, very good, I think. It's always good if films do something to you. And I was not really utterly prepared, you know. I still was thinking of the New Corners film and, they, you know, it had a different kind of tone, really.
really. And when I left the cinema, you know, or, you know, summer from Balkong, you know, um, I always get, you know, into high mood, into good spirits when watching these movies. And then you also had other movies like Halt auf Freier Strecke, you know, and... Um, you know, that was a difficult movie to watch. I didn't know whether I had to leave the art cinema in between. But, uh, you know, now looking at the whole bandwidth of tonalities that you have, that is really interesting and, you, uh, you know, it's hard to do. And um, I would like to ask from you, you know, how you perceive this, how you are thinking about this, the bandwidth of your work, you know, including the film Stopped on Track. Well, this seems to all be part of who I am, or rather, these are all things that I'm interested in, not just as a filmmaker, but also as a human being, you know. The movies that you mentioned, these are all, you know, in, in Stopped on Track, for example, it is actually a movie about life and death. And that's very much true in Hilda's case, too. And I think from time to time we're called upon to reflect on these uh, essential questions of life also in the art that we're creating. So I am totally happy to be offered such a screenplay by Laila and to be able to then uh, have people like Liv and Johannes and uh, to be able to actually make this movie with them because it is a great gift to be allowed to go through these intense times together. And this film was very, very demanding in so many different ways. And I think we also try to take more care of each other than in other movies, which of course also had something to do with these unimaginable scenes that we had to somehow shoot. So we really had to hold on to each other and we were shedding tears not just in front of the camera the whole team was crying from time to time but those are very very existential experiences that you carry over in your life even after the film and I'm very grateful and I'm also grateful to see you know this kind of resonance being elicited in the audience if they dare to watch the movie which I hope but uh, I wanted to add something to Am I allowed to add something? Is that okay? Because I think I haven't really answered one of the questions because it touches upon this topic as well. What is it that I wanted to say? Oh, yes, of course. You know, and I couldn't just do something like this all the time, you know, and uh, by tomorrow noon I'll be dead. You know, I've uh, done something like that 10, 11 years ago. And now I've done this movie, you know, it is to me really, you know, comparable to watching these kinds of existential movies. I don't know what Andreas is thinking about that, but let me just speak for myself. You know, Dancer in the Dark, Breaking the Waves, I, you know, have to think about these kinds of movies. I can't constantly watch them, but they're super important to me. And this also goes back to what you just uh, asked. That is for me as a you know, to me as a human being, it's important to watch these kinds of uh, movies, but it's uh, not a feel-good movie at all. But I think the, their existence of these types of films is justified in all the different cases, but still, you can't really do this all the time. But of course, we are actually dealing with existential questions all the time. And I think it's, it's the most incredible screenplay I've ever read. You know, really, truly. You know, because it has so many different layers. I'm not even probably responsible for saying things like this, but I'd love to say that it really is an incredible screenplay. It was incredibly adapted to screen. We had an incredible camera uh, woman, a director of photography, and then the, the um, also the decision taken by producers to tell a woman's story, to work with women, and to offer and open up this kind of space is an incredible project. And he's also an incredible director who really knows what he's doing in almost all aspects that are relevant. Really. Yeah, that would be nice, says Mr. Driesen. So I don't get to experience that every day. Thank you.
Barbara Breuer from the Märkische Oder Zeitung. Hello. I've got a question that links up to that. What is it that makes working with Andreas Dresen so special? So what is the difference? This is a question that also goes to Johannes Hegemann and Lisa Fries. Well, what makes it so special to me is, well, Andreas and uh, I, you know, I think that we got along pretty well right from the beginning. I mean, it's quite clear, right? Because, you know, I was I was also shaped by his movies, you know. Uh, he, he basically, I was raised on his films and there, now he adapted and adopted me. So that is great, of course. And I remember that I uh, watched movies of his when I was a kid, you know. Um, I was watching his movies and thought, wow, oh, this is life. And, um, you know, that's just true. And this is how his movies, you know, are for me. And, uh, you know, like, for example, the movie Grill Point. And, uh, you know, you know, but it's, it's the people and their complexity that really makes the difference. You know, what makes it special? Well, I think we, as I said, got along pretty well. But, you know, because of one day, because of the, you know, stress that we had when shooting the movie and because we were all tired, we somehow ended up in a corner and I thought something is not right about the integrity of my character and how I'm playing it. And, you know, I'm always open-minded about trying out new things, but something did, just didn't work. And then he said, okay, let's take five. And then he came back to me and he said, I'm terribly sorry. Um, I seem to have got stuck on something. It was not right what I tried to do here. And, you know, this kind of move, you know, in our industry, that he was not about, you know, being right and that he says, I give the orders, you have to do that. But that he rather admitted that he did something that was not quite right, was an immensely humane gesture. It was a grand gesture. And, uh, and he also really knows what he's doing. <laughs> you know, and I've watched the movie and all the movies that I've done in the past, you know, when watching them for the first time, I was never really so enthusiastic about that because it's always difficult to watch your own work and get onto an abstract plane. But this was the first time that I really didn't have anything to say about the movie because it's just a good movie. Well, I mean, that's just the way it is. Yes, I may just add something to that, you know, the cordiality that uh, Andy is always displaying and that he appears to be relaxed. He really just knows what he wants. It's an intense way of working and it's very focused, but he's always relaxed and it's all based on friendship. You know, I, I got to know him when I was in my final year at the acting school in Rostock and uh, he trained us for film, uh, or rather, you know, he introduced us to the, to the world of film and we were training for theatre and he was showing, you know, short films. So he was just basically taking care of us. He was not in charge, you know, but he said, okay, you know, for how we're play acting and, you know, then he had his amateur filmers and uh, he was so relaxed, he made sure that we had break, breaks in between, that we had a bratwurst and a piece of cake in between. And then I thought, okay, now we're shooting. He's the director and there is a whole lot of pressure and he's going to be entirely different. And he was not different at all. You know, I mean, clear. It's it's clear that it's a different way of working. You're more focused. There was a bit more pressure, but you know, the fact that he was so relaxed, so cordial. You know, when you are an actor, he's just taken away the pressure of having to function all the time. You know, for me, it was really the first time, and of course, I was excited, and of course, I was nervous. But the fact that he was so cordial and that he would get so close to you made it so beautiful to work with them. You know both uh, with a view to Andy and Liv. And you, says Liv. Okay, the final two questions, and then we will have to let you go because you will have to prepare for the red carpet. Okay, please. Claudia Schulmerich, Frankfurt Welt Expresso. When I was raising my hand, I wanted to ask about two points that you already mentioned. The one thing is, you know, the behavior, the feeling that these young people had in their lives. I think it's really important because people have the wrong image in their heads as if it was always the BTM, you know, the Alliance of Young German Women. I know that uh, my mother was always complaining about the suppressed morals in the young Federal Republic of Germany in the 50s. And, you know, at least that was better in the, in the former East. And then there was something else that really knocked me over, and that's that the radio messages never got through. And to me, you know, Andreas Dresen, you know, my answer to your question was, no, it was not worth it. But then I went on thinking and I thought, now it was worth it after you having made this movie.
Ja, wir haben natürlich drüber nachgedacht. Well, of course, we were thinking about whether, you know, because it is rather sobering to hear that only one radio message would have come through and that it was a thousand greetings to all our friends, that it was just a test message that didn't really say much. But it was really interesting because it raises the question that Lila formulated a few moments ago. You know, what is resistance and from which point onwards is resistance actually useful or is resistance in itself useful? as a value in itself. I mean, that's a question I'm not trying to answer here because everyone will have to answer that question for themselves and perhaps you might just take the message with you from the movie, from the cinema, but it's a very important and a beautiful question. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much indeed for this incredible movie. This really is my favorite for the Golden Bear so far. You know, but one brief question. Ms. Fries and Mr. Dresen, in your opinion, how can, you know, the last but one scene, you know, the one with the sunlight before the execution, how are we supposed to interpret that situation? Because to me, it uh, conveyed a sense of hope, you know, that there is a light that will always shine, you know, this kind of beacon of hope before being murdered. Thank you. You know, and, uh, well, that's my question. Thank you. Well, that, of course, is a situation that it's that's so incredibly hard to imagine for everyone involved that on this 5th of August 1943 that 13 women were executed in Plötzensee in only 35 minutes. And they were standing there in front of uh, this shed, this execution shed. You can go and look at it. It's still around here in Berlin. They were actually queuing up there. When we went there preparing for the movie, the sun was also shining and in front of that shed there is a plantain tree and I thought that tree might have been standing there back then even so Hilde and all the other women they must have seen that tree and all the others thousands of people were executed there and it was very difficult to shoot that scene because we try to somehow understand the situation which is basically an impossible thing to try and then you know everyone who were gathered there you know all our actors and the extras and we even had acting students there and i told them i can't help you just follow your feeling follow your hearts and then people actually tried and followed their emotions there in the situation and we let the whole situation just run through in real time and our great um, Director of Photography, Ms. Government, you know, she captured it all. And we had this moment when the sun was shining into the yard and live for whatever reason, she can describe that herself, you know, she looked up into the light before she went into the dark. And I found it very valuable to end this uh, situation outside of that chat that way. I think it was about being in the present, the present moment. And perhaps at that point in time, it was the crisis, the you know, most impressive example of the present time. You know, what was there? The sun was there. Looking up somehow felt right. You know, it's 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 getting to be very, very essential, very basic at that point, you know. And the sun was out, but it could have been rain. It could have been raining. And it was just about trying to, you know, perceive whatever you can perceive and experience whatever you can experience before whatever happens after death, you know, but definitely before the thing ends that is your life. Well, thank you. Now briefly, Christoph Friedel and Claudia Steffen, you know, they are the ones who help Andres Dresen and other directors who have been here at the Berlinale too, and they have been supporting his work since Gundermann. Thank you. Thank you very much for your continuous and continuing contributions to the Berlinale. Perhaps you could tell us something about the role that Hans Koppi Jr. played and whether he will be here today. Well, I think we are allowed to say that, that we are very, very pleased that Hans Koppi Jr. will be attending the premiere. And I believe that you all 
have been in contact with Hans Koppi Jr. We all were allowed to meet him. And he was, of course, on the one hand a consultant, but on the other hand, he also gave us enough space to turn this into a fictional feature film. And he is a very touching personality. I think he also individually impressed us all massively, and we're all very pleased that he will be here this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much for your wonderful questions, for your contributions, and good luck to you on the red carpet today. Thanks.